This is the podcast where the dark and creepy things we don't talk about discover a voice. This is Into the Paranormal with Tony Bruschi. You ever think you've got everything under control? Like, sure, life throws its challenges at you, but nothing you can't handle. You pray, you trust your gut, and things mostly turn out okay. But what happens when the rules stop working? When no amount of prayer or positive thinking can get rid of that creeping presence in the corner of your bedroom? Imagine this. You're on a getaway to a quiet lake house, hoping for some R&R, maybe a little escape from the usual grind. But then, the strangest thing happens. Your baby, who never cries at night, suddenly won't stop screaming the moment you put him down. The shadows in the hallway seem darker than they should. And then the dreams start. Not just any dreams. Dreams where your reflection looks back at you with glowing red eyes. Yeah, that's the kind of trip we're talking about here. And it doesn't stop there. The air around you gets thicker. The dog won't leave the safety of under the bed. And no matter how much you tell yourself you're overreacting deep down, you know something's in that house with you. Sitting on the corner of your bed. Watching. Waiting. Now you might think, okay, maybe it's just the house... Old places have their quirks. But when you move to another room, wake your friend and lock the door, only to have the door resist closing, as if something is pulling it from the other side. Well, that's when you start to realize this is no ordinary house, and it sure as hell isn't just your imagination. It all starts with that uneasy feeling, and before you know it, you're running through the house, clutching your baby, praying like you've never prayed before because ignoring this thing won't make it go away. So what was it? A demon? A restless spirit? Or something much darker that didn't like the fact that you and your friends decided to settle in for the night in its territory? Nah. Are you ready for me to write the letter portion of the story, starting with Dear Tony? This will detail the narrator's unsettling childhood encounter and lead into the chilling events at the lake house. Let's go to the letter. Dear Tony, throughout my life, I've experienced things that most people would brush off. Strange occurrences in the middle of the night, moments where I could feel something wasn't quite right. I'm a spiritual person, but not necessarily tied to one denomination. I believe we all worship the same higher power. And I've always relied on prayer to get me through those creepy moments when I felt something else was lurking in the dark. I'd pray, and eventually, I'd be able to go back to sleep. It's always worked for me, until it didn't. I've had two encounters in my life that I'm certain were with something more than just my imagination. The first happened when I was young, and the second, well, the second was something far more terrifying. That's the story I want to share with you today. The first time I felt the presence of something demonic, I was just a kid. My family was on a camping trip, and my brother and I were sharing a bed. I couldn't sleep, tossing and turning for what felt like hours. That's when I felt it. This sudden, bone-deep chill creeping up my spine, settling at the base of my neck. I can't explain it in any other way except to say that I knew without a doubt that something had entered the room with us. Something not human. I shut my eyes tight, thinking that maybe if I didn't see it, it couldn't hurt me. But as soon as I closed my eyes, I saw the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. There, behind my eyelids, were these glowing, demonic eyes staring right at me. It was like they were burned into my mind. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't make them go away. Panic set in, and I started praying silently, trying to calm myself down. I remembered something a friend had told me back in elementary school, that demons feed off fear, and if you're scared, they get stronger. So, I prayed harder, but the fear just kept growing. I tried to control my breathing, but it felt like every breath was fueling the terror. Eventually, I started whispering, Jesus loves me, out loud, over and over again. The more I said it, the more I began to feel a little better. And then out of nowhere, the light above the bed in the camper flipped on. No one had touched it, but there it was, blazing brightly. I can't describe the relief I felt in that moment. 
I got up to turn it off, only to find that the switch was still in the off position. I had to flip it to on and back to off to make it work again. After that, the presence vanished, and I was able to go back to sleep. That was the first time I felt like I'd encountered a demon. I've never forgotten it, but nothing could have prepared me for what happened a few years later when I was 22. It was December 2009. I had just finished a semester of college, and my husband was working overnight shifts. My son Chase was 11 months old at the time, and two of my friends, Sarah and Jack, and I decided to take a midweek trip to my parents' lake house in Greer's Ferry, Arkansas. We thought it would be a nice way to celebrate an early Christmas and just relax for a few days. The drive to the lake house was uneventful until we passed a clearing where you could see the lake shimmering under the moonlight. It was beautiful, but when I pointed it out to Sarah, who was sitting in the passenger seat, she barely glanced at it. She looked pale, almost sick, and when I asked her what was wrong, she just whispered, Nothing. I could tell something was bothering her, but I didn't press it. Sarah had always said she was sensitive to spiritual things, able to sense when something was good or evil. I've known her for years, and while I love her dearly, I never really believed in her gifts. So when she got weird in the car, I chalked it up to her nerves. <laughs> we arrived at the house, and Sarah seemed to shake off whatever had been bothering her. We unpacked, got settled, and assigned rooms. Jack took the room nearest the front door. Sarah took the one diagonal to mine, and I took my parents' master bedroom with my son. At first, Sarah suggested sleeping in the same room with me. But once we got there, she changed her mind. When I asked her why, she said she just wanted a bed to herself for the night. I didn't think much of it at the time, and the first sign that something was off happened around 8 o'clock that night. Chase, who's usually a great sleeper, started crying out of nowhere. I put him to bed in the master bedroom, but after only five minutes, he started screaming uncontrollably. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. I went to comfort him but it took a long time to get him to settle down. Eventually, he fell back asleep, so I left Sarah to watch him while Jack and I ran to the store for some groceries. When we got back, Sarah was visibly shaken. She told me that as soon as we left, Chase started crying again and wouldn't stop. No matter what she did, he just kept screaming. The only time he calmed down was when she held him, but every time she tried to put him back in the crib, he'd start crying again. I tried putting him to bed myself, but the second we crossed the threshold into the master bedroom, he began sobbing again, like he was terrified of uh, something in that room. So I took him back into the living room and rocked him to sleep there. <laughs> we stayed up late that night watching movies and catching up. I was still a little unsettled by Chase's behavior, but I didn't want to dwell on it. By the time we finally decided to go to bed... It was almost one in the morning. At first, I fell asleep easily, but then the dream started. In the dream, I was in a bright, lively room full of laughing people, but for some reason, I was angry, furious even, and I wanted to get away from them. I walked into another room, which was identical to the first, but completely empty. I sat down on the couch and looked into the glass top coffee table in front of me. That's when I saw my reflection, except... It wasn't me. My reflection was lying down, sleeping, but when I banged on the table to wake it up, it opened its eyes, and they were bright red. At that moment, the glass shattered, and I woke up. I woke with a cold chill running down my spine, and immediately I could tell something wasn't right. Chase was whimpering in his sleep, a sound I've never heard from him before or since. I looked over at him, but he was still asleep. The sound was just escaping his lips like he was having a nightmare, but worse. I turned over to face the ceiling, feeling a growing sense of dread. And the door to the bedroom was wide open and the shadow behind it. It just didn't look normal. It was too dark, too thick, like something was standing there, watching. I tried to tell myself that I was overreacting, but every instinct I had was telling me that something was in that room with us. Something that shouldn't be there. After that dream and the unnerving chill I felt in the master bedroom, things only got worse. It wasn't just the eerie shadows anymore. This time, whatever was in that house was making its presence impossible to ignore. 
Every time I closed my eyes that night, I would fall straight into sleep paralysis. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but it's terrifying. You're wide awake, but you can't move. You feel trapped in your own body. I've dealt with sleep paralysis since I was a kid, but this was different, darker. I'd shut my eyes, and it was like something was instantly pulling me into this frozen state where I couldn't breathe or move for what felt like an eternity. It kept happening over and over, and I was helpless. At one point, I could actually feel something, something heavy, sit down on the corner of the bed. It wasn't a subtle movement. It was like someone had just plopped down next to me. I wanted to scream, to jump up and run, but I couldn't. I was completely paralyzed, unable to even open my eyes. Finally, I managed to break free of the paralysis and sat up, but nothing was there. Chase was still softly crying in his sleep, and my dog, who usually slept right next to me, was hiding under the bed. She wouldn't come out, no matter how many times I called for her. Now this is when I really started to lose it. That shadow by the door, it wasn't just sitting there anymore. It had moved. It was closer to the bed, still pressed against the wall, but unmistakably closer. My breath caught in my throat, and I realized that I was no longer just imagining things. There was something in that room with us, and it wasn't leaving. I did what I could, the only thing I knew to do in a moment like that. I started to pray. I whispered prayers under my breath, calling out to God for protection. But even as I prayed, the fear wasn't letting up. I closed my eyes again, hoping it would make the presence go away. But instead, I felt something much worse. A gust of hot breath right in my face. It was like something was leaning in, breathing down on me. And that was all I needed. I wasn't sticking around to see what it was or to find out what would happen next. I bolted out of bed, grabbed Chase, and ran straight to Sarah's room. The dog, who had refused to come out earlier, followed me without hesitation this time. I wasn't planning on spending another second in that bedroom. When I got to Sarah's room, she was sound asleep, and for a second I debated whether or not to wake her. But then I saw the time, 3.45 a.m., Something about that time always feels wrong. So I woke her up, and as soon as she saw my face, she didn't even ask what was wrong. She knew. We quickly moved Chase's porta crib into her room and set it up, both of us working as fast as we could. With the lights on, of course, the bedroom door wouldn't stay shut, though. Every time we tried to close it, it resisted like someone was on the other side pulling it back. After a few tries, we finally got it to lock. Once we were both settled on her tiny twin bed, I told Sarah everything that had happened. That's when she finally revealed why she'd been acting so strange earlier. She told me that while we were driving to the lake house, she remembered a dream she'd had the night before. In the dream, she was driving through a dark forest, and after passing the lake, the trees morphed into the mouth of a demon. That's why she had gone pale when we passed the lake on the drive up. Then she told me something even more unsettling. She didn't want to sleep in the master bedroom because it scared her. She couldn't explain why, but the moment we got to the house, she felt an overwhelming sense of dread about that room. I guess I should have listened to her. But at the time, I had no idea what we were dealing with. We prayed together for a while that night, and eventually I was able to fall asleep. But I woke up the next morning feeling different. I was unusually irritable and not just tired from lack of sleep. Angry! I'm not usually an angry person, but I found myself snapping at Chase for no reason. He wouldn't take his nap, and I ended up yelling at him to shut up, something I've never done before. The anger felt foreign, like it wasn't even mine. Sarah noticed something was off and suggested I take a nap, which I did. When I woke up, the anger was gone, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something had gotten inside my head. Later that day, something else happened that left me even more shaken. I went back into the master bedroom to grab a diaper for Chase. As I was walking out, Chase, who was in my arms, turned his head and looked over my shoulder. He smiled and then started laughing. I froze. I knew there was nothing behind me. But his laughter felt like he was looking at someone or something. I didn't stick around to figure it out. 
I shut the door and didn't go back for the rest of the day. And that night we were cooking dinner when the smoke alarm went off, but it wasn't the one in the kitchen. It was the one in the hallway right by the master bedroom. The one near the kitchen wasn't making a sound. We tried to laugh it off, but the unease was growing and we were all feeling it. Jack, who had a fascination with the supernatural, offered to stay in the room next to mine with me that night. We pushed the twin beds together and settled in, but I made him double-check that both the master bedroom door and our door were shut tightly. Chase went to sleep without any issues, and I started to feel like maybe, just maybe, we'd have a peaceful night. But then, just as I was drifting off, there was a loud crash from outside the room. Jack and I both sat up, our hearts racing. He got up to check the hallway and found the master bedroom door wide open, swaying slightly like it had slammed against the wall. I joined him, and we both stood there, staring at that door. Neither of us wanted to admit how scared we were. Sarah joined us a little while later, and we all ended up talking about our past experiences with the supernatural. Somehow, the conversation shifted to God, and we began talking about our beliefs, sharing stories of faith, and even laughing a little. It was then, as we were talking about angels, that we all felt it at the same time. The weight that had been hanging over us lifted. It was like we could finally breathe again. I sat. Sarah and I looked at each other, and without saying a word, we both knew. It's gone, we said at the same time. The dark presence that had been haunting us had finally left. I fell asleep easily after that and went home the next morning. But that's not quite the end of the story. Tony had followed me home. I started noticing little things happening around my house, small, unexplainable occurrences at night. But Jack gave me some advice. He told me to stand my ground and tell it that it couldn't scare me or my child because we were children of God and it had no power over us. I did just that. I confronted it, told it that it wasn't welcome, and from that day on, I haven't felt its presence again. What do you think, Tony? Was it just a restless spirit? Or was it something darker trying to break through? I can't help but wonder if it's really gone for good. You know, stories like this always make me wonder how much of what we consider paranormal is really just a reflection of our own fears. But then again, when you hear about lights turning on by themselves, sleep paralysis leading to physical sensations and a child laughing at something invisible over your shoulder, well, it makes you start to question things a little more, doesn't it? Now let's talk about what was happening here. We've got all the signs of a classic haunting. A lake house in the middle of nowhere, a sensitive friend who picks up on something bad before anyone else does, and a series of bizarre, unexplainable events that seem to escalate as time goes on. But what makes this story stand out is how personal the attacks were. It wasn't just about the house. It was about the people. From the hot breath on her face to the overwhelming anger that took over the narrator, it's almost like this presence was trying to dig deeper, to latch onto their emotions, their vulnerabilities. Then what's with Chase's reaction? Babies and young children are often said to be more in tune with the spiritual world. They see things we don't, feel things we've learned to ignore. So when a baby suddenly starts laughing at something you can't see or crying uncontrollably in the presence of whatever's lurking, you have to wonder... What was that child picking up on that the adults couldn't? This entity, or demon as the narrator called it, wasn't just about scaring people with footsteps and shadows. It seemed to want to exert control to feed off fear and anger. That's the thing with dark entities. They don't just want to be seen, they want to provoke a reaction. Fear, after all, is their favorite meal. And when the narrator snapped at her child, it wasn't just exhaustion speaking, it was the darkness creeping into her mind, twisting her emotions. That's where things go from creepy to outright dangerous. But here's the part I find most interesting. The power of faith. The narrator and her friends prayed, shared stories about God, and by the end of the night, they felt the weight lift. That moment of collective realization when they all knew the presence was gone, there's something powerful in that. Whether it was faith or sheer will, they managed to push whatever was haunting them out of the house. And when the narrator confronted the entity back at her home, telling it to leave her and her child alone, it listened. 
So what was this thing? A restless spirit trapped in the lake house, a demon that latched onto their fear, or maybe something even more ancient, something that had been lingering around for a long time, waiting for the right people to come along and stir up its energy? The truth is, we might never know for sure. But one thing's clear. When the supernatural gets personal, when it's not just about creaky floors and flickering lights, but about invading your mind and emotions, it stops being a ghost story and starts feeling like a battle for your soul. So, was it really gone after that night, or is it still out there waiting for the right moment to return? Want more ghost stories of the paranormal? Press subscribe now wherever you get podcasts. We're dropping new ghost stories every single day, all year long. This is Into the Paranormal with Tony Bruschi.